はいはいはいはいはいはいはいはいはいはいはいはいはいはいはいはいはいはいはいはい What's up, guys? Thanks for purchasing this Pianon Nidon、uh, DVD. So, first, we're going to talk about what we believe are, are the overarching concepts of Pianon Nidon. So,、uh, for me, I believe that、uh, there's like that idea of、um, large gross motor skills. So, you see the movements here, like this big swinging arm as the first movement, right?、Um, Even the high block, even the turning down block, you're using your entire body, your, your entire arm to just go towards that direction. So,、um, some katas have a lot of like finer skills that you're doing wrist locks and stuff like that, and you're trying to manipulate specific limbs. Whereas, p i a n o n i a n just feels like a very powerful kata where you're just literally just crashing through your opponent or driving through, etc. So, talking about the driving through, like there's. Yeah, those.、Uh... Specifically, I would think like the, the rising block portion of the kata when you're, when you're moving up towards the, the, the three in succession,、uh, particularly feels like driving through. So, I have to remember like、uh, when, when we're driving through, we're not, we're not only saying like we're driving through in the point of like、uh, acting like a battery ram, right? But there's also using like the angles and the movements within the kata to help manipulate either your opponent or yourself around the opponent while you're pushing through them, right? So, pushing through can mean anything from directly over them or over them in angles as you continue to, to drive through, right? Just think about like,、uh, they always use the, the water analogy, but、uh, kind of like a rapids or like a, a flood moving down its path, right? It bangs into something, it kind of comes off, and then it keeps going. It bangs into something else, and it keeps kind of going. So, kind of keep that in mind when we're going through this stuff. So, the first solo drill we're going to do is a footwork drill. So, the first movement of Pian on Nidon was this, and you're going to step in punch. But instead, we're just going to go do this one, and then we're going to do it to the other side. So, my foot is here, it's going to extend out, and it's going to actually drag my other foot to the other side, extend out, and you know, move back and forth. So, what's kind of cool with this is you're going to notice my shoulder points down. As this arm goes around, and actually whips my body to rotate towards this direction. Here. And if you want to do that going backwards too, that actually, it's kind of like the, the sprawling drill that we, we've shown before, like the wizard drill. But it's the same thing where we're going here. Now, yeah, the hammer fist to it, we're going here and dropping, here and dropping, here. So, another footwork drill you can do this is based off of the step high block, and then you turn down block to the other side. It's just to do that down block to the other side in succession, right? So, we pretend like this foot's forward, I turn this way, this foot's forward. So, you're kind of just going back and back and back. You could even turn it into like a solo sparring drill, right? Where you're, turning, you're turning backwards into things. You're even working these. And you're really just working on that gross motor movement. You're just whipping your arm from across your face to the other side. Because both, both drills had that, where it went across here and whipped down, or across here and whipped down and across.、Uh, it's kind of like doing reverse clothesline, right? So the clothesline goes this way, whereas in Pira n i a it kind of tells you you could go the other way as well. All right, so for、uh, when we're practicing some of the footwork and, and that driving forward、uh, idea with the rising blocks,、uh, sometimes we'll, we'll use a band, resistance band here. And、uh, ideally, you want to think about you know, you're actively pushing forward into something, right? So I'm really trying to you see my toes kind of even gripping the mat a little bit before I'm pulling myself forward. And really trying to get myself to push my whole body forward. So I don't want to be, I don't want to allow this to pull me back or have any kind of lean. I have to keep myself, my body centered, crushing kind of like a ball a little bit, and then I'm pushing up 
here, right? Allow it to bring you back a little bit. Don't get slammed back into a pole or anything. But, you know, practicing this kind of helps the firing of, like, your, your legs, your posterior chain, that sort of thing, which is what's really going to help you drive through somebody and also support that weight because you have to remember that when you're, when you're hitting somebody that way and you're pushing through them, you're also you're, you're receiving the force of their body, right? So you have that both pushing on you. So you have to start figuring out ways to really tighten your legs, your lower back, all this kind of stuff in order to help you push through and complete the technique. So, there are some bag work drills you could work on specifically for pin on knee on. The first one is pretty much off of that hammer fist. So what you're going to do is you're actually going to hammer fist and use it as a, like a hammer fist down. Like pretend like you're striking down on a clavicle. So we're here, we're in our fighting stance, and we're working on that. Some key pointers here is I'm lifting my leg up, just like the kata shows where this foot elevates before it sinks down. If you're doing it straight forward, you just want to lift your foot up and land your foot at the same time as your fist. That way it's really your entire body weight going into it. Now you can add different angles too because not only are you going from top down, you're also going from the side as well. So imagine this as like a reverse clothesline because this clothesline goes from here, but the other way works just as fine. So the next one are uh, successive rising blocks. Um, you could always drill them one at a time, just like the Kata shows, but the Kata also has three, three high blocks in a row. So you can start drilling starting on one leg back, you step forward and step forward again. And you drill with the other leg back, you step forward and step forward again, right? So you get to work two, two high blocks that are one right after the other. We call them high blocks, but you know it can be pretty much literally anything, right? So we're starting from here, we're driving through. So you can even think of that first high block as like some form of clearing. So like it moves you out of the way of the bag so that you drive into it again. And always, always, always think about the idea of crashing into something, right? These are these are ramming tools, these are just like your bulldozer, you're trying to get through the bag. So if I start from here, I step through, you think you're crashing in and then you can even step at an angle and crash in with another elbow. So then you get to work going at two different planes at the same time, right? So now we also have those down blocks step into high blocks where you're going like here to here. Um, it's kind of hard to do down blocks facing straight with a bag. So what you can do is stand pretty much perpendicular to it so that when you do your down block, you're hitting it pretty much from the side. So you can do this stuff like here. And you're really working on getting that energy explosive, explosive energy towards the sides, right? One thing to keep in mind, I'm not trying to hit it with my, my bottom fist. I'm trying to put my entire form across the bag. Just like how you throw a, a roundhouse kick, you don't want to just hit with the top of the foot. You want to throw your entire shin. Really try to fold the bag in half. So we do the same thing with this down block here. Now with the step high block, you're already there. You continue driving forward. So just to give you a quick demonstration of just like playing around on the bag using the techniques from Pinan Nidan. So we have things like the dropping hammer fist, we got rising high blocks, we have um, down block high blocks, we have these down here, which I wouldn't recommend doing on a bag because you're just going to hurt your hands. But you can still mess around with it somehow, maybe slap up top so you can drop down low. Maybe changing the range so that you're not just hitting with your hand, you're actually driving bumping through as well. So there's a lot of things you do experiment with on the bag. So I'll just do a real quick demo.
All right, so some of the, some of the weights that, that you can do for strengthening uh, some of the movements, uh, tell you specifically what I'm thinking of when I'm, when I'm, when I'm using them in this kind of fashion, right? So uh, training that uh, rising block, uh, when, when I apply the rising block, uh, it, for me, I think for Michael as well, for the both of us, it's not so much as a, up here like a window wiper or moving across like that as it is kind of like punching up and rotating across, right? That's what's coming up, how, how we tend to apply it a lot. It helps with pushing through stuff. So the thing that I've noticed kind of mimics that a lot is what people refer to as an Arnold press. An Arnold press, I uh, do them seated or standing, which is basically holding the dumbbell here in, in the front position and then rotating forward and pushing up overhead, right? So um, there's lots of ways to do that. If you wanted to, you can add, then you do the curl and then push up. But the main thing that I like is that you start here in front of your body and then you push up over, right? Which is a lot similar to how you do the rising block, right? You start, if you're covered up fully here, then you're starting from here and you're pushing up over just that you're going across, right? So again, it's from here, straight overhead. Uh, don't cross over your head, because that would be dangerous. Uh, like the Aguki, just work on the forward technique here. Another thing that uh, I think is beneficial is doing what's called chest pullovers. Um, there's other names for this. Some people debate as to like whether or not it really works your chest, or some people call them chest expanders. Uh, <laughs> I like it because it's, sim it's similar to this kind of a technique because in this technique you're not so much as swinging your arm around pulling it with your with your tricep or anything like that it's really your back you know a lot of stuff that we do cause is a lot of lat engagement stuff floating around like your scapula right so you're really kind of pulling and contracting one of the things that I've always found kind of beneficial for that kind of movement is that chest expander and we'll just use something like ah oh, that should be so the way this one works, <clears throat> if you've never seen it before, there's tons of videos out there on how to do this properly. But generally what you're going to do is you're going to rest your shoulders on a bench. Uh, your body is parallel to the floor and your legs will be perpendicular, right? So your, your calf, your, right, your shin will be perpendicular to the floor. And then what you'll do is you'll start with the weight above you, you'll let it float back to where it's parallel, your arms are about parallel to the ground and then you pull it back over. So you're pulling over with your chest, but you're also flexing and pulling over, grabbing with like your scapula. So I'll demonstrate here a couple times for you. So the setup is kind of diff difficult, so don't start off with heavy weight right away until you get used to, to setting this up, right? So it's not my whole back, it's just my shoulders here that are on the bench. And your arms will have a slight bend in them. Don't try to keep them completely straight. They'll be a slight bend, slightly bowed out, not 100% out, but just slightly, kind of like in a really close push-up position. And you'll let it flow back, keeping everything tight, your core tight, and then you pull it back over. And you let it flow back, and pull it back over. And that's, that's pretty much it. Relatively simple movement to complete. Um, like I said, start off with like relatively light weight and get that movement down. Uh, everything does need to be tight while you're doing it. Uh, if, you, if you're loose anywhere, you just, it, it, it won't work correctly. So that's kind of like for this technique. Another thing that you can do for that same kind of movement is uh, what they call wood choppers, right? That's like a torso, well that's what some people call them. So it's like a torso rotating uh, exercise. Um, so, depending if you have like a, if you have, if you go to a gym, they have like pulling machines that you can use and stuff like that. I like using them because we have this movement here, right? That this whipping around movement that happens a lot in kata. So, if I'm standing with my torso straight, right, like uh, everything's firm, I'm gonna be pulling with like my with my abdomen, right? So actually I probably want to use something way lighter than this because it's more about getting reps than it is about like building uh, strength this kind of technique, right? And keeping your arms relatively straight, I'm going to pull across until I get that resistance and then come back. That makes it feel 
you know, pretty solid. You can feel like my um, obliques and all that turning. You also have to make sure everything's pretty tight because you're going to be stabilizing every, like your whole entire core while you're doing this kind of movement. And for that specifically, I like to go from kind of like a, a high to a, a lower degree angle. To be honest, it doesn't really matter because it's just really kind of training this body rotation, right? And the last thing that I'll say is that you can do also if you have a band or if you go to a gym and they also have the pulling machines is a tricep press down, but you do them kind of like the chest expander way where what I'm actually doing is just pulling straight down and kind of keeping my elbow relatively locked. So I'm not doing this, right? I'm not pressing down like a tricep press down. I'm actually pulling straight down. And what's getting tight is actually my lats in this part, which is the, what's the pulling action. You'll see some people do something similar where they have like a big, where they have the pulling machine, they'll have the bar that goes across and they'll pull that way. It's a lat exercise, right? So you can do them one handed also with the machine and pull it down. And again, you're actually like really engage your core if you're doing them one sided, like one arm. Uh, even if you use both, you have to engage your core a lot, you know, firm stance, all that kind of good stuff. And you just pull it down to your side. Again, your elbows won't be completely locked out. There'll be a slight bend on them. And you just really focus on uh, contracting your lats all the way down to your side, right? Hand placement is going to be about there, right? Because you want to mimic as much as we can the movement in karate and how we would use it in general. If I want to pull, I'm going to pull down this way in a kind of a neutral hand position. So there's some things you can kind of play with uh, in your strength routines and add them in to develop some of the same movements and strength within those movements uh, for the kata. So there's some mitt, pat, mitt drills you can do as well, taken from the katas, of course. The first one's like a hammer fist drill. So I'm just gonna flash different, different images of the pad and I'm, all I'm gonna do is just strike it with the hammer fist, just like the kata shows on top, right? Keep in mind, I'm also dropping my foot at the same time as a hammer fist. That way you're really putting your body weight behind these things. If he does it on the other side, same thing, right? So you do it as a one-arm drill or a two-arm drill where you start from a fighting stance and he shows it. So another combination taken from Pino and Nidan is that down block, step high block. So Aaron can flash down and I can step through for high block. So this high block here, you could imagine most likely it's, a, it's an elbow right here, crashing in with that. So. Honestly, all you have to do is put your put a shield in front of your head and step through. So we could be shadow boxing here. He flashes, he flashes down. That's my trigger to go on to the sequence, right? So any variation of that as well, where you're kind of putting different stimuli into your drill and then working on that specific sequence. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> like Michael said, don't forget that you have like kind of like that call, right? So everything is white noise, and then the signal to do the technique is this, right? And that's where you go from there. So don't just try to keep that in line. Basically, then you can do, you know, if you roundhouse kicks, and then I give them this, same thing. So now some partner drills you can do. Um, the first one here is going to emphasize that first movement in the kata where you're shouldering down and then going back across over the top. Um, Aaron's going to get an underhook on me here. And he's actually going to drill this. So he gets to work and I get to work. So he's going to get the underhook and shoulder me down and keep me down like that. So that's going to mimic the feeling of trying to, for him to do that. Right? So he's drilling that. Now what I'm going to do is, I can't resist this since my, my posture is already broken. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn away from it and get my arm as loose as possible. I'm not going to try to fight it, I'm just going to lift my arm away. And what's, what's cool about that is the movement in the kata actually returns it towards the direction that you're escaping from, right? So, of course, since we're strikers, you can hammer fist that your opponent. So he, Goes here, shoulders me down. I gotta regain my balance. I gotta lift my arm out. And when I'm there, I'm already gonna strike down right on top. So, some targets to strike 
to strike on, of course, the face, the nose, the clavicle. Um, those are probably the yeah. most common ones. Yeah, I don't know. You go for the shoulder, but there's a lot of things that um, that will do a lot of damage or more damage than other stuff, right? So we, if we go live with it, we're here. He gets on her hook and shoulders and down. I'm trying to fight it, it doesn't work. So I gotta limp my arm out and go over the top. So we do it on this side. Here, notice how he's compromising my posture. Therefore, I need to turn away and then come right back. So another partner drill you can do, um, this is like a human dummy drill, right? So Aaron's gonna have his arms out like this. I'm gonna grab the same side. Instead of going for uh, an arm drag, I'm just gonna go underneath and pull it over my head. And again, this mimics that same position, pulling the weight over your shoulder. Same side grab, this arm goes across and goes underneath. And instead of trying to grab, I'm just gonna put, a, gonna put the top of my forearm on here. One thing to keep in mind is my forearm needs to kind of roll his arm to make this elbow bend. So if I'm on this side, I'm not just gonna try to break the elbow because you're not gonna be able to just lift them up like that. I'm gonna try to roll it this way so it creates like a little concave place for me to fall into and turn, right? And just like the cut that shows, my foot opens up this way so that I can turn and face the opposite way. So, and here, open up over the head, turn and face the opposite way. <clears throat> Some key details for that, once the arm goes over the top, I wanna have control over anywhere above the elbow, the elbow, right? Because if I have it down here, he could bend the elbow and counter. Um, so once I get to here, I wanna have pressure here and also try to turn him towards that direction. Because the next move in the kata is a step in, in a forearm, right? So that actually that kind of tells you what what you're able to do right after that, that uh, swing. Thing. So the other part of drill we're going to have, we're going to show you, is uh, a leg manipulation. So if you have your partner's leg here, the goal is going to be for me to kind of feel where his. Uh, where he's the weakest, and those, that's the point that I'm going to attack, right? So we're focusing on, on these moving here, right? That's what we're going after. So if I have here, and I'm pushing this way, I can start feeling that's a weak area, right? Like that plane, I'm pushing across. So it's not pushing necessarily down on his knee, which not that that can't be effective, but if they just do that, they just flex up on you, that's pretty much it. What you can do then is you rotate, push the knee out. So I'm here, and I'm cupping his leg, so I'm actually like, Finding this groove here where the ankle is, and I'm gonna drive it forward, it goes down, and I can swim his leg over my knee. All right, so you can practice that technique, and really it's like about, you know, it's, even if you have to catch it on the other side, it's the same, it's the same thing, right? Instead of pushing down, I'm always trying to push down, I'm going to look for the point of the knee where I can start to rotate it, and then I can drive it this way. Right. So that's the application that you can have for that, and that's how you can kind of train that with a partner. Uh, so if you if he struggles with it, which makes it better, right? So I'm pushing here, even if I have to rotate it, right, to keep the driving flow go. Uh, you know, you can kind of mess with it that way. So going with our theme of kata's movement, we're going to go into our applications. So we're gonna organically build these applications. So Aaron's all, all Aaron's gonna do is do this hammer fist. Every now and then if he sees an opportunity, he'll step through to the high, high block. But what I'm going to do is just throw stimulus at him, jabs, punch, kicks, etc., and see what comes up of it. Also, trying it at different ranges as well, right? So first we'll start from a distance, and then we'll start from the clinch, and then we'll start even closer to where it's kind of like his frame's broken and what can he do from there. Um, again, all he's doing is that, and all he's doing is that.
Cool, so you guys noticed like there are a few things that recurred a lot. Um, driving in with the forearm preemptively happened a lot from a distance. Um, swimming from underneath the arm happened a lot from the clinch and once the frame was broken. So that was what we were talking about earlier, this type of drill. And, and what you notice is the theme we were talking about for Piano Nido and was like that large gross motor skills, right? So if you want to touch on that, just whatever hit. Yeah, it doesn't really matter, right? Like uh, if we were trying to be, if, if we we're trying to like actively hurt one another, then like uh, the, the, the range of motion would be greater, right? So yeah, I wouldn't be like curtailing any of my techniques, right? So even just doing this lap would, would then be trying to drive all the way through, right? We're trying to take care of each other here, so we're not, we're not doing that. Michael doesn't have any hand care on. So, so even coming here, this would just be that the next follow, follow through would be that, right? So you want to be on top of them as much as possible. Anytime that I was able to get here, meant that the next thing was going to be here, crashing in that way, right? Or even just the succession of the rising blocks, just shoving through your opponent. But yeah, like you, you should be able to see that. Uh, I'm not so much as aiming for like a specific point as I am just aiming to like move his body or his appendage. And then even if it's something like that, like it's my whole entire arm that's gonna come crashing down, right? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna change my movement and go like, oh wait, I'm too close to apply it that specific way. Let me adjust here and hit him with the bottom fist. No, if I, if I didn't, I'm this close, well, I'm still just gonna drive through. And it starts to look like, you know, something completely different, right? It looks like, oh, and then I'm crashing through this way. Kind of a deal, it's still the same movement, right? Over and over again. Yeah, that's an interesting point, too, because some people might teach it as specifically, this is a takedown from Piran Nidan, but they don't consider the idea that that movement changes, the application changes based on where you are in relation to your opponent. Yeah, and like the, so like the sooner, so you can see there, like it just clicked in my head right now, like that's, that's exactly what people like will say that you can help you, well, even we say that you can apply like a down block that way, right? Like if I'm, if I'm pivoting and I'm training this way, then I can come in this way and do a down block that way. It's kind of like a takedown. Well, if you're under more active pressure where he's pushing in, and so I'm kind of, doing this to lean and then come down, the same thing is going on, right? It's just kind of like a, a more fluid looking downward block versus coming straight across. It's just coming over here. So that just starts to tell you that, well, that's a bottom fist or, or a down block under, under duress, right? Kind of a deal. Cause then it's like, okay, well, one thing that I'll do sometimes is I'll do, I'll, I'll, I'll push in this way if we're like kind of like stand off spar, sometimes I'll up this way and then just come back over and use it like a, a straight up strike. Well, I mean, it is and it isn't kind of a deal. Uh, so you just have to keep keep that open mind about when you're applying all these techniques. You know, uh, a rising block from here into the into his into his chin is essentially me doing an up a punching up, right? Kind of a deal. But my goal was a rising block. Well, who cares? You know, if I'm that close, that's how it's gonna come off, right? If I'm this close, then this, I'm in the rising block kind of position, right? So I'm using this to guard, and then this, boom, drives through. Maybe I hit him in the face. If it does, great. Uh, if not, then I continue with the movement and continue to drive through. Yeah, very interesting. I mean, you could be like rising block of the shoulder throw or yeah. whatever. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense, right? Because then it's like, well, what if you get, because a lot of times like you do stuff and it starts to get funky because it gets like kind of, things get caught up and you start to realize all oh, this stuff gets caught up in your gi, right? So if you're just following through with the movement, then it's like, you know, if I'm this close and I start doing a rising block and my hand gets caught, well then I'm just gonna continue with, with, with that momentum, right? Or continue driving you over, right? And then it's like, well, that's that movement, right? I'm here, I got caught, I have your arm and I'm pushing, pushing over kind of a deal that's still that movement pattern being be reproduced right so just to show some specific techniques for the leg leg takedowns if i am lucky enough to grab aaron's leg maybe <laughs> through a slow kick or something <clears throat> you always want to think um the hip you you can open up the hip by pushing the knee outward or you rotate the knee inward and that turns in the other way right so 
One opens them up this way, and the other turns them and face, face the opposite way. And when that happens, when you open them up this way, it's a chance for you to take them down like a spiral. So you can, if I grab your leg, I open him up, I'm able to do a circular takedown all the way to the floor. Right? If I take him the other way and make him face away from me, then that's really, you're pulling straight back to put him on his face. So I'm going to pull straight back to take him down like that. So that's something to keep in mind. Depending on how you orient the person is how you're going to be able to dump him onto the floor, right? So it's like, if he's still straight with me, either I pull him back to take him down or I push him onto his face, right? Into like a wheelbarrow, push him position. If he's still facing me but off to the angles, then that means that the takedown has to be at an angle as well. So another takedown from there, I open this up and I step through, it's still another angle takedown where I'm looking away and I, I drop him towards that direction. Um, the drill we were doing earlier where you feel where the knee is going, it kind of tells you that you can combine those takedowns just depending on his reaction and whether or not the first one is a success or not, right? So I try to open this up, he counters by pushing it in, so that gives me the, the freedom to pull this and take this down as well. Like I was saying earlier, I can start pushing him forward into the takedown here, rather than trying to pull back. So, so those are a couple things. Another thing for that is um, for takedowns, and this is with the arm and the leg and whatever, the smaller joints you manipulate, the, the easier it is going to be, right? So <clears throat> for the leg takedown, if I try to work his knee and he's really strong, then there's, it's going to be kind of pointless for me to try to do that. But I can do the exact same thing if I just move down his body and I'm doing this, right? So I go to his foot and I turn this way, it's the same thing. Or I go and turn his heel this way, it's the same thing. And if you take the person away, you're still doing that same motion with, with the kata. The same thing happens with the arm, right? If I go here, he still resists, that's fine, but I can still do that same motion with, with the wrist. So keep that in mind. It's, you can take someone down like this. It's a lot easier to take someone down like this. It's even easier to take someone down like that. So as you move away from the, the limbs, the joints get smaller easier to manipulate. Even easier than that are our fingers, right? So you have four levels of takedown potential to think about. So we're going to try our best to do some light sparring with Pinon Nidon, just using the techniques that are exclusive to that. Of course, some um, other things will pop up just because it's, it's human movement, right? You're going to have to use everything in your, in your repertoire. But to the best our, of our abilities, we're going to try to uh, use the things we know for Pinon Nidon. So, as a recap, hammer fists, um, down blocks, step high blocks, high blocks in succession. Um, you also have a pull back down block to the other side. And you have all these things going down as well. So if you break it down even simpler, down block, high block, and shoot through face going down. All right, hammer fist, that's four. Cool. <laughs> so, um, just some quick discussions. If you don't need it for me, as I was saying in the beginning, it's like a driving for type of thing. Driving means conviction, commitment. We talk about this a lot in our class where it's 
once you decide to go, it's go time, right? And it's good that Piran Niran has all those large gross motor skills too because when it's go time, there's, there's no time for delicate, intricate type of movements. You just gotta go in and blast through whatever hits, hits. Exactly, like the gross motor movements, all that kind of stuff is like the, the bread and butter, pretty much all of the, all of the katas, at least the, the majority of, of all the forms that exist. Uh, have a have a large amount. Uh, very, I mean, very few have um, small joint manipulation in it. But usually, at least as far as I'm concerned, very sure as far as Michael's concerned, that's like more of like a, I that's like a, that's like an afterthought to me, right? Like if I'm dealing with small joint manipulation, it's because it's like super presenting itself. Like it's I fell into it, or it's just like blatantly there. Yeah. Uh, but it's never something I go for, and it's uh, off the bat, just because the uh, one the thing that you have to also remember is that what do you also train the most, right? What happens the most, right? Like uh, people talk about, like you know, the training your CNS, like in that responsiveness. Well, I've trained with greater uh, rigor and enthusiasm. Uh, these big gross motor movements, ergo, they're, they're, they're the ones that are the most prominent, right, when, when I combat, right? So you have to remember that if you, you train them as such, and, and so they will come out as such, right? So that's why we kind of like really gravitate towards that. But it's it's true, like you, like you said, it's, um, it's, it's it's kind of impractical to trade to chase after small joint manipulation right off the bat, right? Yeah. So if you're in tier, we're spurring off for some reason, and I'm really just trying to, to go for these. I'm missing the big picture, which is a big arm going to swing at my face, right? Same exact thing happens when we're talking about nice defenses, right? If he's trying to stab me with a knife, and all I'm focused on is a knife here, I'm just going to get clocked in the head over and over and over again. Whereas, of course, you address the, the situation at hand, but then after that, you gotta go for bigger things just to stop the, the threat in its entirety. So, it's the same exact thing. I'm not gonna try to search for those things right off the bat. You yeah. know what I'm saying? When it presents itself, it's, it'll be there. You know, it's like that, uh, it's that saying, uh, you know, you miss, the, you miss the forest for the trees. Right. Kind of a deal. So, finger pointing to me. Yeah. So, you just got to keep that in mind. And, and that's why we kind of gravitate towards this stuff because it's the stuff that's going to be replicated like most often, most frequently. And so, if you can train those things really, really well, then uh, the likelihood, like your percentage of coming out of uh, an altercation uh, uh, less unscathed is better. Right. So, when you go to this stuff, you train it hard, you train it under stress. And uh, that increases your your chances, right? That makes your chances better uh, versus always doing them in a vacuum in the in the air, like without an opponent, or always uh, shying away from like, well, those gross big motor movements don't look as nice. Well, yeah, they don't look as nice, but I mean, generally, combat is like real combat is not necessarily a beautiful thing. There's beauty in all things, but. You know, it's a gritty, it's a gritty thing, right? So, you just gotta keep that in mind. You know, when you're when you're training kata and you're doing, if you choose to do any of our techniques things that we show you, it's it's they're there for a reason. You know, they work. They work for us, um, and we apply them every day that we train. You know, so definitely. Is there anything you noticed in sparring that came out? I noticed like a. Uh, you know, it's all like you said before, it's about commitment, right? You have to like commit to something. The, the more you debate about what you're going to do, the less likelihood, uh, the, le the lesser chance of it like being successful, mm -hmm. right? You know, it's, it's, that's like with anything, like even like archery, right? Like it's, you're shooting at a target, uh, the longer you wait, the harder it is to hit your target, right? So you have to kind of find that kind of flow, that steady state where, you allow stuff to come out. You don't necessarily force stuff, but uh, you you go for the opportunities that are presented versus uh, second guessing yourself, right? You know, it's like um, that happens like with somebody get when they say, "Oh, he got caught," right? And then you kind of like 
UFC match mm -hmm. or boxing, usually somebody gets caught when they're looking for the perfect thing in order not to get uh, in order not to get tagged. You know, that's what a lot of people are always kind of worried about. It's like it's different when you change your mindset into going like I'm going to get tagged. Right. Right. I'm gonna throw this technique and I'm probably gonna get tagged. But I'm not gonna get tagged as hard as if I just stood still and took a my opponent's technique. Like, right, right. Go on, right. Yeah, I was noticing like <clears throat> midway through we were kinda of having a stalemate, so that's why I started like hopping around right. just to yeah. get the get the action going. But in the back of my head still I had like I'm gonna give you white noise, but once you come back I have my thing that I'm gonna work. Mm -hmm. And like uh, like I was able to do something we weren't even discussing throughout the whole thing. Right. Yeah. Being able to get that. But that wouldn't have come out, like you said, if I didn't have that in mind, regardless of what you threw at. Right, yeah. Yeah, because it doesn't, that's the thing with like katas and, and forms. People always like, since, and once you get out of the idea of like putting everything in a box, right, like if, like if I say I'm going to do a down block, like it doesn't really matter what you give me. Like I'm still going to apply it. If that makes sense, right? Like, it doesn't matter if you give me a kick, a punch, if your body's too close, if your body's not so close, if it's your head, if it's your arm, your shoulder, I can still do a down block and it's gonna give me something uh, that's gonna be to my advantage, right? And so, you know, that's why you can kind of have these things when you're training, when you're sparring with somebody, you can have a thing in the back of your head. Like Michael said, like, I'm going to, I'm gonna, I'm gonna apply this technique Right when the opportunity uh, presents itself, because the opportunity presented itself is basically me moving in. Right, that's the opportunity. So I mean that technique, you know, if it's if it's me moving here and you do that technique, it's you know if I do it with this, it's it doesn't it doesn't matter, right? It's still the techniques being applied, it's still coming off. If it was my leg, it's still the same technique, it's still the same things going off, and you can see then how, you know that how that comes out. And the better you get at that, then it becomes the response is there. You don't have to think about it, right? So that's what's kind of cool about that. If once you start training under stress and you you apply real action in real time to it, then it just starts to become like second nature, right? Like uh, like my I don't think about my bottom fists. Like my bottom fists come out. It doesn't matter who it is, it doesn't matter if we're just sparring with hands or hands and feet or we're grip fighting, like I do this, this motion comes out a lot. Why? Because, uh, because of being on Iran, but also because we do a lot of nahachi, right? So bottom fist for me is, is super easy. It just, it just kind of, I find ways to apply it all the time. It doesn't matter if it's like Michael's hand here or if it's a, or if it's his own fist coming at my face, right? Sorry, <laughs> but it's like all these movements, right? Like it doesn't. The goal is this, but I'm still gonna whip my hand around, right? So it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't matter, right? It's, for for me, it just kind of comes out because I've done that movement a lot. What's cool about that too? Um, going back to what what I was able to do, depending on what he gave me, is what I get to do next, right? So mm -hmm. it kind of tells you like. Which kata can you choose yeah. from? Can you pick from? Or which kata did this divulge into, right? Because if I went to here, I get to his outside, so that means like the next movement can be this way, right? So he had like something like that. Whereas if I go on the inside there, I gotta watch out for that. So that means I had to do something else. And that might be a completely different kata based on that first movement that he just yeah. did. So it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, and we've touched on that before, like the idea that like, uh, all your katas, like in sparring, uh, should really just become one giant kata, right? Like one giant active kata, right? Like your nahanchis is combined with your pinyon is combined with your pasai is, is, is they're all, they're all should be there. And any moment that limb presents itself in that way means you can apply that part of that kata, right? Like I don't have to begin it in with pinyon nida. I can begin with the middle of Pianidan and end with the beginning of Kusan Kudai, right? Possibly, right? It, it's, everything's there. It's just the movement patterns that come out when you need those movement patterns to come out. 
And so that's why, even though sometimes it's not always the funnest thing to do, you have to, you have to drill your katas over and over and over again, right, to get that muscle memory down. Well, thanks guys again for uh, purchasing this DVD. Um, yeah, so we'll be coming out with the, the next ones, Piran Sandan, Yongdan, Goldan, and then moving on to the Naihanchis and stuff like that. So we'll, we'll continue to be cranking these out whenever we can. Um, if you guys have any more suggestions on how we should run it, the template of the, the DVD, let us know. Uh, we're always up for suggestions. So thanks again.